smallish shoulders <laughs> to live up to the expectations. We have a challenging uh, topic, rather I have a, cha a challenging task of introducing you to a subject which is relatively young, uh, if you would call 20 years young. Mm -hmm. With globalization came the need for this subject and uh, that's how it has today become a much sought after input for several organizations the world over which whom I support um, ironically enough to do better business because I, I say ironically because my earlier education comes from language and communication. As you would see, um, this is cross-cultural communication skills. The graphic amply illustrate, illustrates the intention of the lady to come closer by wanting to shake hands and the gentleman bowing and moving away. Uh, this is a classic example, but this is a very superficial, uh, at a very superficial level. Let me tell you how I feel at the moment. At the moment I feel totally at sea because I'm going to, in 20 to 30 minutes, introduce you to uh, a subject which is as deep as the ocean. So I hope I will do justice to giving you a glimpse of what is cross-cultural communication. First of all, let's define what communication is. It's the activity of conveying information through exchange of ideas, feelings, intentions, attitudes, expectations, perceptions, commands, by speech, non-verbal gestures, writing, behavior, etc., etc., etc. Let me give you a small example. The fact that, for instance, I arrived 10 minutes before the program is a manifestation of something that is invisible, namely, my need to communicate to the world that I respect time. So, therefore, by this definition, behaviors are the deepest of communications. Why is it that we wear khadi? Because we are communicating our respect for, for self-reliant, handmade fabric. So, the reason why I'm giving you these examples are to request you to move away from a rather restricting and traditional understanding of communication as language alone. Let me, def let me tell you why. Uh, for instance, making a product in a factory at Oranadam by some people who are from provincial Indian backgrounds to meet the de uh, demands of somebody sitting in Japan is intense cross-cultural communication. How will you make a product that corresponds to the needs of a client, a customer sitting in some geography of the world? Here is a small verse, I leave you to read it. Okay, if that is communication, just think about add cultural differences to it. How challenging would that be? Okay, let's start with math. How good is your math? Anybody here to take the challenge? Yes? 220 into 40? Not bad, okay. 450 minus 29? That was rather quick. 540, that's supposed to be divided by 5. Okay, 180. 762 plus 345. Eleven zero seven. Okay, that was rather quick and rather smart on all of your part. Now we move to a land where all these symbols are used, but these symbols have a different meaning. The first one means divide by. The second one where you put a small dash means divide, multiply by. Now tell me the answer. 220 I don't hear many voices. Okay, 450 divided by, no not divide, multiply by 29. Okay, alright. 540 
plus 5, simple enough, 762 minus 345. Okay, the point that I'm illustrating here is what happened to your math skill? What happened to your math skill? It didn't come to good use. It didn't come to good use. Your hard skills are intact. We've become global today. We've entered the world where the same symbols are used. The same symbols are used, but they communicate an entirely different meaning. Just imagine if this were the billion dollars that you needed to collect from a customer. Can you afford to make a mistake in calculating these numbers? Okay, so that's to illustrate what it is. Let me give you another example. This is a detergent. Unfortunately, there's nothing for me to draw here. One of the largest multinationals that we are all familiar with today, I wouldn't want to mention the name, had a very successful detergent in the United States and in some parts of Europe. It worked very well and they wanted to launch in, the, in Dubai, in uh, Emirates. And uh, what they did was they had to, uh, they were uh, rather afraid because the competition was also planning a launch and they wanted to do it before the competition. So they looked at the campaign, which worked so tremendously well, and they found to their good fortune, the uh, advertisement did not have any text. It only had pictures. It had a dirty, soiled white shirt, which the next picture was they're dipping into the detergent bucket. And then the third one was a bright white shirt with, you know, dazzling white shirt. They said, then, we are in luck, let's introduce that. And they actually introduced the campaign and they found that it bombed. No one bought the detergent. Any good guesses? Yeah. yeah, the people read it as, you know, a white shirt washed in the detergent becomes soiled. It's, it's a very small fact that the Muslim countries read from right to left. And when ignored, the company, actually this is a true case study, which had to pay a huge amount of, uh, you know, which had to incur a lot of losses until they corrected the mistake. So all communication is cultural. It draws on the base. We have learned to speak and give non-verbal messages. Another question, in communication, what do you think is more important? What we say, how we say, or how you look? How we look. Sorry? How you look. How you look. All the three. All the three. Okay, all the three are important. Then what percentage do you think they are important? How you sound, how you look, and how what you say. 50, 50, 50, which is 50? What you say. What you say. 50. Mr. Martin, I'm not surprised. He's a man of letters. Okay. Who else? How you look is 80%. Sorry? How you look is 80%. How you look is 80%. Here it is. How you look is 55%. And that's the body language, that's the non-verbal part of it, and how you sound, that's the paraverbal communication. And what you say is a mere 7% only. This is Mehrabian's communication side. Alexander Modi. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, how you sound, this is a, para, a non-paraverbal communication element, that is, do you speak over somebody else? How much pauses do you embed between sentences? Do you modulate your vocal energy? All these things are actually the elements that contribute to successful communication. Not just what you say. And here we break our heads saying, oh, I don't know Chinese, and I don't know Japanese, I don't know Timbuktu, and I don't know German. Well, if you knew, that's useful. But what you should be really worried about is how do Germans use their body? How do Japanese embed pauses? What does the Japanese silence communicate? Not the word Japanese, for that you can use dictionary. But what do these pauses communicate? Just imagine you're sitting in a high-powered negotiation team in Japan. People across the table, they don't say a thing. And, but the silence is communicating, it's eloquent. For instance, in the Japanese culture, they never say no they would say something else. The fact that they left the room after having shaken hands does not mean they are okay. The fact that they did not say no does not mean that they are okay with the deal. Okay, what makes communication across uh, cultures so challenging? 
I'll tell you some of the factors. Here are two sets of data. I'd like you to guess which set is more uh, or rather better organized than the other. Left or right? Right. Obviously. Right. Yeah, okay. Right is one, two, three, four. You'll be surprised to know the left is as much, uh, you know, logically organized as the right. Anyone who guesses it? Alphabetical. It's alphabetically organized. Yeah, it's al alphabetically organized. The very fact that we say the right is correct, that my mind has started already sorting out the left as chaotic, wild, not orderly. Why does it happen? What makes the right more virtuous than the left? Did you think about it? Something very, very important. No, it's easy. <laughs> Why is it easy? It's what we are familiar with. Absolutely. The familiar <coughs> decode, the mind decodes the familiar as right, converse, unfamiliar as wrong. And today, we, all of us, we have moved into an interdependent world. America's fortune is going to impact our fortune and ours, South Africa's and South Africa's, Italy's and what have you. We've moved into an interdependent world. Can we afford to have this us and them division and decoding the unknown as wrong? The second one, I'm going to show you three maps. And I want to tell you which do you think is the wrong one. Sorry? The blue, one. blue one. the blue one? What about the third one? Third one is the wrong. Blue. Third one is the wrong? Stretch. It's too stretched. You'll be surprised to know the most inaccurate one is the first one. It's the first one. The third, the second one is by an Australian schoolboy who was continuously taunted as down under. He said, if we are living in a world that is constantly revolving and rotating, and we don't need the reference of a pole star anymore because we have sophisticated purposes, why do we need to have the North American continent? You know, why do we have to have that? Let's now think. I want to put my country on top. And the third one, you know, the blue one is therefore not wrong. And the third one happens to be the most accurate map of the world. It's called the social justice map or the accurate map of the world. Any guesses why? It looks like it's from the globe. You know? Absolutely. It takes the convexity when flattened out into account. And why it's called the accurate map of the world is because the relationship between land masses, like one country to the others, are much more accurate here. If you see the traditional world map that is number one, you'll see that China is just twice as big as Iceland, which is absolute bunk up. It's not correct at all. So this is just to say that there seems to be some kind of an aversion to the unknown. Okay, here, how many of you grew up in a small town? Can I take a quick poll? Small town. Okay. Who grew up in a large uh, metropolis? You consider Chennai large All right. Uh, it's all a continuum theory. It depends on, you know, Chennai is smaller than Mumbai and Chennai is larger than Coimbatore. Okay. Just the point that I'm wishing to make is just imagine you are five years old, those of you who grew up in a large city and you're sitting in a train, you're traveling alone to see your grandparents for the first time living in small village. The train is about to start, what would your mother tell you? Be careful. Be careful. Don't trust strangers, don't talk to strangers. Don't eat the food that's sold here and there. Don't drink the water, it's not big city. Okay, those of you who grew up in small cities, same scenario, for the first time you are going to a big city to see your uncle, traveling alone with some neighbors, your mother comes to see you off, what would she tell you? Large cities are full of thieves. Absolutely, she would say the same thing, don't talk to strangers, it's not a small city, don't eat the food, it will be dirty. It will... So what, what happens to human minds when they perceive something that's unfamiliar and unknown? Fear. And this fear is something that's absolutely serious. It has caused world wars. It's called xenophobia. Mm -hmm. And xenophobia has been the reason for world wars. You know what happened to six million Jews for no fault of theirs, just because of a xenophobic manifestation of a ma man's mind, they have been annihilated. 
So this is something uh, very serious, but even at business levels, where we have to collaborate, you take Microsoft, you take Cisco, you take Cognizant, wherever, they have to work with people sitting in Perugwe, in Prague, in Timbuktu, in uh, some remote part of Sweden, and they have to collaborate where trust is critical to global success. And again, trust cross-culturally, what is it that you would require to trust somebody? That is again culturally motivated. I mean, I'm a part of a team which is doing research from Cambridge Judge Institute of uh, Management, uh, Nigel Levington and David Tricky and I, we have done a, a lot of surveys to show that what Indians, Chinese look for to trust somebody else is absolutely different. We've identified 10 criteria. The study shows that benevolence or goodwill, you know, he has goodwill for me, then I trust you. But you take Northern European cultures, they don't care whether you have goodwill for me or not. You have the skill, I trust you. You have the competence, let's work together. That's how we do business. So trust criteria are again culturally motivated. Let's take a fine meal for a guest. How does it look? Do you call this a good enough hospitable meal for a guest? Yeah, indeed. The plate is full. The qualities are sufficient. Would you like your guest to go away hungry? Never ever. Right? How does a fine meal look in France? <laughs> yeah, because a fine meal, this in France would be Disgusting. considered disgusting. It kills the appetite. It's so unrefined. It's it's like it's kitsch, right? And here in India, my grandmother would absolutely break into tears. Yo yo, yenna panita, she would say. How can you do that? Some more quantity. You see the Asian portions, how they are. So what is being hospitable? Again, varies from culture to culture. If you are not sensitized, this is what you would be doing in global collaboration situations. Tug of war. Here is an interesting uh, theory. This is by Milton Bennett. This says that all of us go through a journey of getting comfortable with differences. I would say culture as differences. Something that is different. For instance, I talk about it. Uh, if you are younger to me, the way you think, you solve problems is going to be different from the way I do. And if you are a gentleman and I'm a lady, the way we are going to resolve issues is going to be absolutely different. That is called the gender uh, cultural differences. If you are a Marxist socialist and I am a capitalist, the way we are going to look at problems is going to be eminently different because it's the ideological differences. You are from the sales, I am from finance, I will be looking at something else and you will be looking at something else, the way we resolve problems. That's departmental cultures. You are from IT and I am from the medical world. Do we resolve problems the same way? No. That's the industry culture. You are from China and I am from Japan. We look at problems differently. That's the national culture. So when we say cross-cultural differences, we are not only going to talk about national cultures but also other cultures. But today we will stick to national cultures because that's the easily predictable. Because uh, we will be looking at archetypical behaviors of people from Northern America, from Southern India, or from Japan, or from uh, whichever part of the world. Archetypes are necessary. Archetype is a general tendency of a group of people to behave in a certain way. And we need classifications. And like just like in zoology and botany, we need to know how people think. But that doesn't mean that every person who is belonging to group A, group B, group C will behave just like an archetype. That would be stereotyping. Because stereotyping doesn't provide for any new information or altering of any judgments. And that's the risk. Okay, now I am coming to what is called the intercultural development continuum. It simply is like this. First, I tell my grandmother, who has never left a small village in Andhra Pradesh, I tell her, you know, Amama, you know, in China they eat monkey brains. What do you think Amama's reaction would be? <laughs> would she believe me? Would she believe me? Do you think she would believe me? She said, cha, 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 cha. not at all true. That is, she is in denial. 
and that's the beginning stage of all our intercultural journey. We would first of all deny that there is another way of communicating, another way of life. And then we move to polarization. <laughs> then I show her the YouTube videos. You see, they are actually killing. They are cooking the monkey brains, they are eating. What would she say? What do you think she would say? It's a different world. Yeah. Would she say it's a different world? She would be disgusted. She would be disgusted. She would say, whatever you may say, dal, rasam, sadam is the best in the whole world. Or sambar, idli is the best in the whole world. Dalla kandravi, yapurda shabrado. So that is, that stage is called defense. The moment you encounter another way of thinking, another way of living your life, you become suddenly, you identify your own way of life as superior to the other. That stage is called polarization. And then she meets two young students who are Chinese who come and stay in her house upstairs, one room. They're such lovely girls. She gets friendly with them. What does she say? Pao, avalu korandelda. That is called, the stage is called minimization, where you try to play down the differences and to accentuate the similarities. Okay? I'm going to relate this to the business scenario. The next stage is called acceptance. Then she says, okay, they come from northern China where not a blade of grass grows six months in a year. What do they do? Do they die? They'll have to eat meat. She rationalizes, she accepts that there is another way of life. And then my grandfather gets posted to Beijing, Chengdu. She goes there, she lives there for 18 years. She learns to eat with chopsticks. And when she's in China, she eats with chopsticks. When she comes to India, she eats with her fingers. That stage is called adaptation. Just put this in a business context. People who are from Microsoft or from Cognizant, who are working or having to work with people who are in China or somewhere else, when they encounter another way of solving a problem, the first thing they say is, how can they even think of doing it this way? It's wrong. They're in denial. And then they start saying that our East or West, India is the best. Okay? And then they move on to that, hey, not bad. Oh, they do it like that, is it? I see, we do it this way. Two, saying that, okay, this is another way of solving it to great you, we have in our team people who can look at problems this way, we have this way, so we are the winning team. See, the realization is that in today's globalized world, previously we were playing a game where there was only one winner, and the rest were losers. Today we have completely changed the game. If you lose, I lose too. First of all, there can be many winners. And if anybody loses in the game, because as I said, it's an interdependent, it's like Skittles. Somebody loses, you lose too because of the interdependence. And therefore, adaptation is continued. This is actually a profiling instrument. It's uh, by Milton Bennett and um, Mitch Hammer. And this profiling uh, tool comprises about 30 to 40 questions. And people who are posted to another country or students who are sent to another college in another country, before they get the funding, they do the profiling test, and if they're found to be up to minimization, they're withheld. They're not sent. They're coached like by people like me. They're coached, and we repeat the profiling instrument, and unless they move into at least acceptance, minimization is good enough. The reason why minimization is not the best is that by playing down differences, you lose out on the differences, or on the advantage that differences Bring. Here I need to tell you, 60s, 70s, those who were in the U.S. will know U.S. society was called the melting pot. The melting pot because different ethnic groups came to the United States, they came, you know, just like in a metaphoric melting pot, they lose their identity, become one homogeneous mass called America. Today even the U.S. has moved away from the metaphor called melting pot, they use the salad bowl. Just like in a salad board, the tomato has to look red and be juicy and the walnut crunchy and brown. The individual ingredients need not, should not, cannot lose their identity. But we need each of the ingredients. Olive should look black, should look oval, should be uh, semi-soft, tomato should be large, red. So we need every individual ingredient to make a salad bowl. 
so we moved away from the metaphor of uh, you know what you call the melting pot okay culture now the way we do things around here uh, i just want to uh, i don't want to make it too uh, scientific but i want to give you a little bit of background gert hofstede whom i met he is kind of the father of our field uh, 1960 around the 60s he did his first study based on ibm which was a microcosm of uh, diverse uh, uh, cultural groups working on one project he took the data from that and he found that the way people did business depended largely on their culture and that was kind of the beginning and now what is culture culture is some of them are observable that is the way you dress the language that you speak the monuments that you have your religion all that is called visible culture okay the invisible culture is in your culture what is important for you atithi devo bhava do you think it will work in germany no when we were children when guests came we had to sleep on the floor and give the cot to the guests we would curse the guests but there were it was non negotiable a value is something that is non negotiable but this is a concept that just doesn't exist in some other cultures they have some other values all values are good we will talk about it so the invisible part of it what do you see here it's the metaphor of an iceberg and why an iceberg sorry this will melt and then yeah the, the hidden part is far 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 bigger than the visible part that's why it's called the iceberg and if you think that oh i'm going to the us they speak english i speak english i drink coke they drink coke we eat pizza they eat pizza it's no big deal i can do business there titanic can happen <laughs> because what is you know really invisible the difference is what is really the, how do i do value proposition to buy this company what is it that an american company will be looking for it's not the words it's not the language but what's important for them what can i use in order to negotiate the deal that would depend upon assumptions attitudes values i'll give you an example i'll give you an example let's say that um, you know i i'm a vegetarian okay i i go to a conference i meet my colleague for the first time from finland in somewhere in denmark is the conference and i am telling i'm asking is this uh, oh my god is there egg in it or oh, is there gelatin in it and i said the man there are about 80 dishes and i can't eat any one of them and the my colleague takes cold cuts sausages and everything as we talked earlier what we is unfamiliar what is not mine the mind send tends to judge as bad so what am i thinking of this gentleman saying 7 o'clock eating uncooked meat what kind of a guy is he and he thinks how fussy she is supposed to be an international consultant and she is so fussy so the judgments that we make are based on our own core values and that's why we need to know what the values that prompt people's communication style people's behavior this is the onion ring we talked about that you the core the generation the uh, industry the national culture the layers can be any number any number supposing you know you you had spent you had a stint in freemasonry in your young days the way you resolve problems are going to be highly influenced by that so the sum total of all these layers is your behavior and it's impossible for anybody who is working in a remote geography to know all these layers but what is predictable is the national cultural layer and that's the reason why cross cultural communication focuses on the geographical culture geographically motivated cultural differences okay so here are some values i wish i had some something to write on Okay, I just wanted to demonstrate. Doesn't matter. Can you pick on about four or five values that are Indian? Respect for elders. Respect for elders. Renunciation is something that is. Renunciation. Yeah, the color orange in the flag stands for renunciation. Though we have forgotten about it. 
And what else? Hospitality. Hospitality, Atiti Devo Bhava. You know, adages in Proverbs, they are the sum total of the entire attitude or, you know, what is important for a culture. Frugality. Sorry? Frugality. Frugality. Fine Come on, Mr. Madhu, I know you are very good sense of humor, but where is frugality today? <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Yes, frugality was. Fine art. Uh, a fine art. All right. right. So you take the case of Germany. I just want to demonstrate something to you. Love for the country, punctuality. Love for the country, not now. It's a bad word in German. Orderliness. Sorry? Orderliness. Orderliness. Structure. Reliability. Uh, punctuality. Okay. If you remember these five Indians and values and this. If you're working together globally, you have the work, the task to be completed, and you have the people with whom you need to work, right? So what is, what are the Indian values focusing on? Do you recollect respect for elders? Is it task focused or people focused? People. People focused. Hospitality? People. People focused. Spirituality? People focused. Renunciation? People focused. What about orderliness? Orderliness, German value. That is task. Task focus. What about structure? Task. What about punctuality? Again task. Again task. What about reliability? Okay, where are the people? <laughs> I have a doubt. Okay. We, 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 we came up with these values because we interact with those cultures Correct. primarily on the basis of work. That's right. So we judge them yeah. on work-related values. These are work related. Yeah, yeah just the fair enough argument, but I just want to reassure you. But the five values that I chose for each of the country are highly researched. <coughs> Libraries of books are being written about what are the core values of each of the cultures. And, uh, and the other thing is that at business, what is important for you is prompted by your socialization and acculturalization, and that is and culture. Programming, cultural programming gets over when? Before you're 10. And after that, it's cognition. It's only what the brain thinks and not the uh, acculturalization. I'll give you an example. For me, and also why the cross cultural communication is. Um, are we somewhere close to the. We have another 15 minutes? Five minutes. Okay, I'll, I'll very quickly. <laughs> I have not even come anywhere close to what I wanted to say, but I will very quickly tell you. I will give you an example of what is, um, for me, I was raised in Chennai by a traditional, uh, you know, very Brahminical uh, upbringing, frugality, education, all those things. So for me, the five values are fine. And then I worked for a German company where we had, I was very proud to say that I had uh, punctuality, structure, reliability, blah, blah, blah. One day I was going to meet my boss for a performance appraisal conversation. I live on a third, fourth floor apartment. What do I find? I closed everything, all three doors, and the lift was not working. And why the lift was not working, I don't know, but whom do I see? An 80-year-old aunt of my husband's climbing up with prasadam from Kovil. <laughs> my heart sinks because I look at the watch, there's only five minutes left. And then I tell her, I had to quickly take a decision whether to open the door, make her sit down, or tell her, sorry, auntie, I can't. What do you think I did? My brain was telling me all the negative consequences of, you know, being uh, late, what will happen to my conversation, I won't get the raise that I want, my boss will be upset, angry. Take your grandmother, your auntie. Yeah, I had to open the door. And that's when... The choice that you make depends upon your cultural programming. And the cultural programming, it's the needle that the gut, the gut needle has to say yes. Only then do you feel comfortable, whereas the cognition can be tricked into. So I will very quickly jump uh, and quickly tell you the um, individual and collective. You, I told you that the Indians are people focused, right? So we can call them the people culture. You know, people culture or collective culture, which other collective cultures do you know? All Asian, mainly Asian. All Asian, African, what about Europe? Portugal. Yeah, Southern European, Mediterranean, my big fat Greek wedding, you know how family oriented they are. Italy, Spain, they are all people cultures. And the Americas? 
Uh, the Southern American is again people cultures. So you take the Northern America, you, make, you take the Northern Europe, they are both individual. individual cultures. And what is it that makes culture? Very quickly, last five minutes, I think it's very important. One of the things is the, the sorry, climate. sorry? Climate. <laughs> climate, absolutely. It's the climate. All the things, Asian, African, Indian, uh, you know, all these cultures have the sun. If you have a lot of sun, people come out. They interact with each other. Consequence, the population is more in all these countries. There are more people, you know, using the same square meter, which means their requirement for body space is far less than people who live in the northern uh, hemisphere. And extend it to the mental space, do we have a sense of privacy? No. no. Do we have a sense of confidentiality? No. No. So this is, these are the, uh, some of the things that are impacted when we are doing business. The other thing I want the, um, that impacts is history. If you take uh, Maya Incan civilization, Southern America, Mexico, you know, uh, uh, Mongolian civilization, China, Babylonian civilization, the African countries, Indus Valley civilization, they're all born around water bodies, which means the DNA of our communication is sharing, networking, and also these are all culture where the hierarchy pyramid, there's a chief, there are subordinates, so hierarchy consciousness is in the part of our DNA. The other most important thing that all of us really find very tough to negotiate when you're working globally is that the people culture, the most important thing for the people culture, whether it is Indians, Thai, South Americans is you probably have heard about this sentence a thousand times in your life. Naal pere kena mohate apni kaam hite. Naal pere na sulwa. Who are this naal pere and what is the compulsion that we talk about? And what is this mohum? It's the honor. It's the intangible thing called honor, which when put at stake, there is the danger of you losing your membership to the community or to the group. And that is the biggest driver in communication in people culture. They are called the face cultures. And face cultures, the compulsion is so large that the maximum number of suicides are committed in Japan when children don't make it to colleges. IIT entrance exam results are announced, you know, the kids uh, try to, because they can't show their face to their parents or to their teachers. So this, imagine somebody who is in the northern European, northern American continent who is working with the Indian team has no clue about what is important for face cultures, writes a negative feedback email, put CC the whole team. What can happen? The fellow will leave. And today, the team leader's appraisal depends upon retention of talent. Today, we live in the times of attrition where people, Indian youngsters, have much more options than the Germans sitting in Germany. And the fellow put CC inadvertently, this is the biggest communication blunder committed by most of the people outside. The other thing that I wanted, to, I'll just finish this, is here, opinions, the blue is the individual, individual cultures express opinions based on one-to-one -one experiences, their own, whereas collective cultures are people who, we base our estimate of somebody on the experiences of people whom we trust. My uncle says that this restaurant is very good. My professor always told me that so-and-so is a good writer. It's not based on us, which is fine. The reason I'm saying this is that if, when an American or a German hears you speak like that, will think that you don't have any opinions of your own. Okay? The next one is about punctuality. Human time, rubber time. In India, 12 o'clock is 12 o'clock or 5 to 10 or 12 to 5. It is decoded as when the driver has come, when the lunch has arrived because it's based on the human aspect of time whereas the abstract time, individual cultures. That is 12 is the clock hour. We'll talk about it. I just want to show you this feedback. Individual cultures tell you what they don't like, when they, what they think. Whereas in collective cultures, can you say when you go to somebody's house, the food is spicy, can you say, sorry, it's too spicy for me, I can't eat it? Can you say that? No. No, you can never say that. 
Again, there are studies which divide the world cultures into truth cultures and peace cultures. We are the peace cultures. We suppress the truth for peace, whereas the truth cultures suppress the peace for truth. Yeah? And yeah, this is the most important thing uh, before we finish, then I'll uh, leave you to <laughs> go. One is the dots, what do they represent? People, is this a familiar scenario? Yeah. yeah. It's not only the people, can it be the work, the way we process work? Yeah, the black dots are work. We work in, a, you know, the people who are individual cultures, or when they talk, when they write an email, <coughs> when they present, they go in a linear, unidirectional way, one after the other. Whereas the Indian thinking process is radial. It could be Z to S to A to Y to X to K to P to R and again to S and X. Whereas in the individual cultures, the way they organize their thoughts is linear. It is A to B to C to, and it's unidirectional mostly. It may be two directions, but not never more than that. Okay. This is another important factor dealing with problems, conflict resolution. In collective cultures, we have a problem uncle in the family. We say, you know, I meet him in the, at a wedding and I come back and tell my mother, you know, guess whom I saw? I saw uncle XYZ and I just pretended I didn't see him. And my mother would say, good. Nallaralam, she would say. Okay, that means that conflict avoidance is a conflict style of people who are from face cultures. And conflict, take that conflict headlock is the individual cultures. Just imagine we don't have time to think about how it's going to be when we are together in a negotiation context, but this is the basis without which, again, uh, like I said, the individual cultures are monochronic. They have only one understanding of time. And the polychronic, we are polychronic, many things at a time. Can we, can we eat first sambar and then sweet or this? We can do what we want with this thali. Just see this. It's first the soup. It's a degustation menu. And then you have the entree. And then you have the main course. So it is in a linear order. We, whatever we do, our communication is dependent on this. This again, the polychron, the, uh, the concept of time. For people like in India, we believe in, have you ever heard anybody saying at least in my next life I'd like to have a Ferrari like Sachin Tendulkar? You've heard that statement? What does it mean? In this life I'm not going to get Sorry? In this life I'm not going to Okay, it, it means that there, is a, there, is, there could be another life. There's some subconscious <laughs> belief. That means that there is a second chance. So cultures which have a, a subconscious abstract belief in a second chance, do they believe, do they experience the same pang in their stomach when they miss a deadline or an opportunity? The cultures who don't have the concept feel. That is another area of struggle that I have as a consultant, where people say, why are people not even reacting to the deadline? It is so deep and damp. Yeah, um, now I don't want to bore you with it, but I'll ask you exactly, would you like to have a question and answer for five minutes or shall I close it or how do you like it? We'll have a question and answer for five minutes. Yes, I, then I will just finish with this slide. One is, uh, this is an interesting thing. If you see, there are countries which are linear active. Linear active means they are cool, factual communicators. They are planners, they, that is Germany, US, Norway, like I said, the individual cultures which are from Northern Europe. And then they go up to Italy, Spain, Brazil, Venezuela, where they are multi-active, warm, emotional. And then we have Chinese, we don't know what they're saying, what they're thinking. They are absolutely cool, they are courteous, amiable, they compromise, they are accommodating. So these, this is the communication scale of various countries and how they communicate. Uh, probably I packed too much in my preamble. Uh, that's okay. I'm happy to answer questions.